One of the objectives is how do you actually bring about teams together? How do you bring about data scientists, data engineers? How do you uh, bridge this gap between the data scientists, data engineers, and the business world? So uh, a lot of you will be disappointed. This is not going to be a Python talk. You know, the, and what exactly am I going to do, uh, am I doing at a Python conference? So uh, the vision what we have uh, with respect to data science and machine learning is that uh, the tools and technologies what we use today is a means to an end, right? And there's an objective behind. The objective is to solve a problem. It always starts with a problem. Right? And, and in most of the cases, it starts with either a business problem, a social or an economic problem. Right? And uh, uh, this is something which, I real, which is really interesting, which I came across about uh, four or five days back. So there was this data science uh, manager who was trying to recruit data science profiles. Right? Uh, he said, uh, you know, you really have to ask the candidates what is going to be the expected ratio between the fun, which is the modeling part, Right, versus the, the the actual amount of work which involves the pre-processing, ingestion of the data, and then writing the codes, debugging the scripts, and then putting everything into production. Right? I don't know how did he come up with that 0 0.3. Don't ask me. But but what he said really made sense because today we find a lot of as researchers, data scientists, on one end, we are trying to work on models, and on, on, and on the other side, you have this entire business world who is not able to understand what we are doing, right? And there's no one, basically, to translate their business needs to uh, the language in which we can understand, and there's no way in which how we can really go into the uh, business world and understand the, uh, uh, their problems. So... Uh, this basically points to the fact that today there is the, the, there's this rising need of, of people who are like full stack in the data science domain, right? And they are capable of going all the way to production. So uh, where did it all start? I do not know. I'm sure you would have probably, uh, you would re remember this first uh, uh, article which was written by DJ Patel in Harvard Business Review, right? He said that, you know, uh, the sexiest job of 21st century was being a data scientist, right? So everyone who was a data scientist really felt sexy about themselves. And, and then there was this, uh, this, this, this whole bunch of uh, researchers and engineers who want to become data scientists and who actually start moving into the industry, right? Including myself, which was like you know, I was I was I was in this uh, academy and research, working with the algorithms for a long time, and then uh, there was this uh, this 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 platform called Kaggle. So uh, I do not know. I'm, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you would be would have heard of it. Uh, can I can I have a raise of hands just to uh, get an idea of how many use Kaggle today? Okay, so uh, for those of you who are not aware, it's a collaborative platform where you have the companies who, so you have organizations who actually come with a data set, right? And they, in most of the cases, anonymize the data set, so we do not have any clue as to what those features are with what we are working. More or less the business problem we know, what we are working, but, but, but the objective at the end of the day is basically to come up with a certain kind of a model Right, and a predictive model, for an example, and based on the accuracy or the prediction score of this model, we are, you know, I mean, uh, the organizations have a set of rankings, and based on those rankings, we basically win prizes. Now, what is really interesting to understand in, um, in, in, on, on Kaggle is that the difference between the person, the, the difference of prediction accuracy uh, between the person who actually won the competition versus the person who was like on the 50th or the 100th rank is not that much, right? So Kaggle start really pushing people towards building best models, except that building best models was not or is not actually the solution to the, pro to, to, to the problem or is not the solution to the real business problem, right? Just to illustrate, to give you an idea, let's say for an example, we have a business problem with a bank. The bank wants to identify, well, they already have the data sets, they have been working for a few, for a few years now, they have been working on exploratory data analysis. They know, for an example, by intuition, 
what kind of clients they would have to target, clients who are already within the bank, right? They would have to target in order to retain them back, back, right? Not let them leave the bank, right? So this is a typical churn uh, use case, uh, uh, which has been existing for quite some time now. And it, uh, the, 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 uh, the marketing campaign director realizes that these campaigns are ineffective right now. Right, and so he says, "All right, I have like a budget of, of half a million euros, for an example. And over the next one year, I'd like to Im improve the effectiveness of my marketing campaign. So I actually call up a consulting firm and I say, "All right, I'd like to implement uh, da uh, data science models." Right. So there are two two mindsets in the data science industry today. One mindset is going to come up with model A, right? They're going to say, I have a very high accuracy model. It is still in the R&D phase. You know, I'm going to deliver it to you probably about three or four months from now. And it's got low interpretability, right? What I mean to say by low interpretability is something which, you know, well, which, which, which even for a data scientist is more or less a black box, right? Uh, whereas someone who comes up with model B, who says, you know, we have lower accuracy, but something which is production ready. And it is highly interpretable. Now, there's a huge chance that, you know, the second model gets accepted because that is going to get or increase the return of investment is in us in a short time possible for the client. So why high interpretability? In most of the cases, uh, if you look at, for an example, decision trees, right, uh, random forests, these are those kind of algorithms which are more or less visual to someone who is not a data scientist, right? So when you're talking to a marketing campaign director, he is more confident in order to replace his existing know-how, or not completely replace, but partially replace his, ex his existing know-how by a model which is going to be highly interpretable, right? So there's always this gap between <coughs> what a data scientist is thinking on one, on, on, on one hand and what the business needs. So if it is not just building the best models, then what exactly is an efficient data science project, right? It just turns out that there's this, there's this whole, uh, um, a whole bunch of topics which we have to address for a, for a, for a data science project to be successful. Uh, there was a study which was carried out by Gartner about two, three years back, which, uh, which, which, which indicated that about 87% of data science projects fail, right? And it has got nothing to do with having a good data scientist or, you know, having the best models. It has got everything to do with the whole package. I mean, what comes along with the best models and the best data scientist, right? And so uh, we ended up basically identifying um, a set of uh, uh, a blueprint, rather. And what I'm going to present to you is only just one part of the blueprint. So uh, according to us, the, 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 the first objective of a good data science project is that it creates value for the stakeholders. So the stakeholders can be either the business people, and for them it is basically trying to uh, increase their return on investments, or it is going to be solving an economic problem or a social problem, right? And then, apart from you know, creating the value for the stakeholders, of course, with Within the creation, uh, within the value creation for the stakeholder, there's this whole uh, topic of how do we identify which use case, right, based on the data science capabilities of the organization. But then once we have that, right, for the execution of the use cases, moving from proof of concepts to production, what kind of a data set do we use, and what what do we mean by a right data set or a right data, right? What do we mean by right tools and infrastructure? What do we mean by modeling? What are the right models or the best models? And probably one of the most important things, even which is more important than modeling or, or tools and infrastructure, is organization and methodology. Right? How do we federate data scientists and data engineers in order to achieve that objective? So again, this subject is really vast. One of the ways in which we have been working on, I'll probably be uh, talking a little bit about this in this presentation, but the idea is basically to have to start having this healthy exchange in order to bridge that gap. Uh, so the, uh, the 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 first point, which is basically creating value for stakeholders. So it all starts with a business problem, right? There's always some kind of a business problem or some kind of a problem in general which exists, 
right? In the case of businesses, it's always a return on investment, right? The return on investment for businesses has to be predefined. This is really important because unless and until we are not able to compare how, how better we have been able to do by implementing the data science algorithm versus uh, doing nothing or having no algorithm at all is uh, basically what is going to define the, the uh, efficiency of our data science project, right? A second aspect which is probably most important is how do we uh, uh, brief everyone regarding the technical KPIs and the metrics. So in the case of use case which we just looked at, you know, where we were trying to uh, identify the churners, right? Uh, the, 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 the marketing campaign department, all they want is basically to increase their, their, uh, their, their, their precision, right, in terms of targeting the, 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 the customers. For a data scientist, this is probably going to translate in terms of uh, KPI metrics such as precision recall curve, right? But how does a data scientist understand basically this business problem and how does the business people translate their, 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 their business problem into those metrics is the question. Of course, then we have this whole question of, you know, uh, if it's going to be a proof of concept, pilot, or production. Well, one of the most important as uh, the things what we have realized is bring, bringing everyone on board, right? Identifying who the clients are, uh, the IT department, having the IT department on board is probably one of the most important aspects which enables success of a data science project product owners, right? And then there's this question of, you know, uh, are we really going to have our own data scientists working on this project, or is there going to be a vendor solution which is going to help us move faster in the, or accelerate the value? So once we have identified the business problem, there's always this question of using the right data. Probably this is one of the most important fa uh, aspects when we are talking about accelerating data science projects, right? I mean, uh, if there's garbage in, there's going to be garbage out, no matter how much we are going to work on the models or how efficient those models are. So a huge amount of time is actually spent on identifying what the internal and external data sources are, right? And uh, uh, what is the life cycle of the data? So what, what exactly do I mean by life cycle of the data? Say for an example, we have taken an assumption that, okay, we have had some in external data sets, probably it's open data. We are using extensively open data. We are crossing this with, with our internal data sets. We have built a model which we have productionized, right? And two years down the line, we did not realize that, you know, there was this, 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 uh, this, uh, this contract with the, with the uh, data supplier which actually ended, right? So how do we actually anticipate all of those, 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 um, uh, those risks which are coming from the data providers? In terms of, of course, we, we, we all know the volume, velocity, variety, and quality. But in terms of storage, what kind of an infrastructure do we actually store on? So these are all of the questions which are probably uh, really important when we, when we are actually working on data science project. Uh, of course, there's this question of what exactly are the right models. I did touch on this a little bit in the starting of the presentation, which was a lot to do with interpretability. Right, so uh, this is something which is uh, which is which is uh, pretty interesting. So uh, you know, one of the uh, one of the product owners basically comes and says that you know I do not know basically how can I actually increase or uh, make a robust network. So you know, there is two of his colleagues who said you know just add more layers, and a third one basically says you know we should probably not treat it as a black box. Right, we should probably try to understand, and he gets kicked out. So, so uh, this is fine as long as you know we are not really move, uh, moving ahead and going and talking to the business people. The moment it comes down to talking to the business people and telling them that you know what, so far all of these years, whatever you were doing, we are going to probably replace that, right, with something which even we don't understand or which is probably difficult to explain to you. That is where he says, you know, you really have to stop, and you know we we, we cannot proceed further. So there is this, uh, uh, of course, there's this whole question of, you know, how do we actually move in the uh, entire data, uh, data science uh, pre-processing and modeling uh, life cycle. 
uh, and I believe we all are aware of all of these, uh, uh, these cycles, but we have to understand that all of this is not really linear. Wh what I actually mean to say is, as we move from extraction all the way to deployment, there are going to be a lot of to and fro's, right? Uh, just to give you an example, one of my clients, uh, they implemented uh, two sets of algorithms. One was based on machine learning, traditional machine learning algorithms. Another set of algorithms was based on uh, heavy uh, Monte Carlo simulations. And they all came down all the way to the end, right? Uh, and when they actually wanted to go into production, they had two choices. They, either they had to uh, reserve servers like EC2 uh, uh, instances on uh, AWS, for which they realized that the cost was a little too high, right? Because they could not aff uh, afford basically to, you know, to have those servers up and running all, all the time. And then they start move thinking about uh, having serverless such as uh, AWS Lambda. And for AWS Lambda, they did not realize that they had used heavy libraries, which was going beyond the limits of AWS Lambda, going beyond the memory limits for AWS Lambda. And so he had to go back once again and rework on his model. So uh, the, the to and fro between the model creation all the way to the uh, production and deployment is something which will happen. We really cannot avoid, except that what we can do is try to have this vision of what we are going to implement or on what architecture we are going to implement in the end, and try to, ha once having that vision, trying to trying to keep that in mind while we are actually working on the uh, models. What we typically do is we add another phase towards the end uh, regarding model maintenance, right, where we say, you know, we just go ahead and push the uh, first model immediately into production, and then over time, over iterations, we actually try to replace those models with better ones. Then there's this question of using the right methodology and organization, right? Are we really researchers or technology accelerators? Uh, having a right methodology, like I mentioned, probably is one of the most important criteria in making a data science project successful. How we look at it is basically having a kind of an initial phase, which is called the audit phase, right? Wherein we, wherein we actually work with our clients in order to understand what their data science capabilities are, what are the use cases in terms of their business return on investments, try to prioritize all of those business use cases in increasing value of return of investments. And then what we do is we actually go into a kind of an action phase where we have a global initiative now, the global initiative, which is initiated by, you know, the product owner, the chief data architect and data scientist. And then you have those individual agile teams, which are working around this global initiative uh, in an agile fashion. So what it basically helps to do is have that entire global vision with uh, the smaller, uh, with the individual visions across, uh, uh, around each and every use case. I'll probably skip this uh, slide, but I'll probably move over to uh, using the right tools and infrastructure. What we have realized based on our experience is we probably have to be more generous with using technologies and tools, right? Um, so uh, what exactly do I mean? So we typically have a tendency of, you know, uh, ingesting the data set on Jupyter. Uh, using pandas, working with scikit-learn, coming up with models, and trying to say that you know we really had a very good performance on our model. Except that when we move to uh, uh, a real data science project, which moves from proof of concept to production, uh, things get really wild, right? So uh, just to give you an idea, I mean this uh, is uh, 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 this is the process flow for uh, one of our clients with whom we worked. So. Imagine that that client is basically the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the marketing campaign department of the bank, which I talked about, right? So he comes on and he talks to the product owner, and the product owner basically says that, all right, I have to assemble an entire team, right? And he has to get the IT department on board. So w what you basically see is there is, you know, uh, he might have his data on a traditional data warehouse, from, from where the IT department has to push on to some kind of a framework, which is like storage and processing. In this case, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we used Hadoop. And from there, you have two teams. So one team, which is purely data scientists who are actually working on algorithms, right, in, 
ingesting the data and then trying to push the intermediate results onto uh, a, a, a database such as, uh, such as PostgreSQL. And then you have a second set of agile team, which is trying to retake the code from the first team and trying to automate it. Right? So there's this whole discussion about what kind of codes do we write, because the code which is written by the, 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 the first team is not immediately, uh, cannot be actually pushed into production. Right? So there's this whole question of what kind of tools do we use by the second team. Uh, probably it is going to be uh, uh, Airflow, but there's, there's definitely going to be you know, uh, a lot of Python codes which has to be written, re, uh, re, uh, re, uh, reusable Python codes which has to be written. Then there's this whole question of automating the entire process flow. Uh, and then pushing it back, uh, pushing the intermediary results back into the uh, database. And if at all that is acceptable by the client, pushing it back to the, the uh, production systems. So just to give you an idea that you know these are all of the tools which we used, and probably there were about three data scientists plus one data engineer who was working on, on, on this kind of a project. So there's this huge set of tools and technologies which, uh, I, mean, I mean, today there's this notion of data geek, or uh, rather than a data scientist, a data geek who's capable of, I mean, who, who, who we can actually say is a, is, is a kind of a full stack uh, data scientist or a data engineer who's capable of touching all of those uh, tools and trying to push things into production as soon as possible. So this is just one way to do things, right? And I'm definitely open to discussion. Uh, I'd really love to know what exactly are your, uh, uh, your, your, your feedback in the way you have been implementing things. So thank you. Uh, just to finish the talk, we, uh, my company is, uh, is actively looking for data scientists, engineers, and architects. So if at all you or have plans to move to France or in Paris or in Bordeaux, do uh, get in touch with me after the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, here. So, any questions around here? Well, I have a question. Uh, what's the size of your teams, how many, with how many data scientists you would say do you approach uh, an average maybe your problems? So, uh, what we try to do is we try to have smaller agile teams. Uh, the more smaller they are and the more diverse they are, the better it is. Right? So one agile team could actually have about two data scientists, one data engineer, along with uh, one uh, business analyst or a business consultant who is actually able to understand the business problem. Right, and how we actually work is we actually work in terms of sprints of uh, 30 or 40 days trying to push uh, in the initial phase, uh, phases uh, the proof of concept and then over the next 30 to 40 days of, uh, of pushing the same proof of concept into piloting and production. Yes. Uh, great talk, thanks Yasir. Um, could you give like some examples of this, the sorts of projects you guys are working on. Um, I, I'd be curious specifically if you're working on anything in NLP or what you're seeing companies interested in. So yeah, they, there's this whole talk around NLP and NLU. Like, I mean, if in case you look at uh, the recent advances in NLP and NLU, uh, we, uh, most of our focus is probably uh, towards uh, chatbots, right, or sentiment analysis. But uh, when we talk about NLPs and NLUs, most of it is already taken over by frameworks. So we, at least from a conversational perspective or conversational implementation of NLPs and NLUs, we, uh, in, in the next one or two years, we see a lot of these frameworks uh, taking over and trying to do... Uh, uh, much of our work, uh, but in terms of uh, the 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 use cases, like one of the use cases which I talked about, you know, uh, which 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 was like identifying the churners, there are still a lot of companies who uh, who, who who are who are having that gap. There's this gap which is which is existing, and uh, there's still a lot of work which is which which is supposed to be done on uh, on these kind of use cases, right? Where where the 
the need of the R is deploying those basic uh, machine learning algorithms, which we which we which, uh, which we often see on Kaggle, all right? And and yeah. Some more questions from the plenum. Hello, thank you for your talk. Uh, you talked about understandable models and why you should prefer them. But I, um, I mean, what is understandable for you? If you have a decision tree which has like depth of 50, is it understandable? Or if you have a um, like a random forest, uh, you can derive feature importances, of course. But if you have 200 trees, there's no way to know uh, where the decision come from. So what's your take on that? So, uh, for random forest, for an example, the, 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 the algorithm which you just mentioned, there are three, they, they, they are uh, uh, interpreters, basically, which lets you condense all of those forests in order to provide a clear interpretation in terms of an average uh, idea about all of those trees. I can probably search the reference for you. Uh, but just to give you an idea as to what exactly is interpretable, this is something which is uh, understandable by the client who is a non-mathematician, right? So if you actually go and talk to him about uh, neural networks, it is probably a little bit more difficult for him to understand than, for an example, looking at a 50 depth uh, uh, tree, for an example. So in most of the cases, when we talk about interpretability, it is to do with... Uh, um, how easy it is for uh, a non-data scientist in order to understand, or how, how, how easy it is for a business person to understand uh, the algorithm. I think we have time for one more question. Um, hello, thanks for the talk. Um, when transitioning from the um, data science Scrum team to the DevOps Scrum team, do you usually throw away all the code the data science group made and the DevOps team just reimplants it in the infrastructure, do you um, reuse it? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, uh, if you actually look at the previous slide, so uh, one of the reasons why I have put in that, that, that arrow is basically to indicate that one of the most main focuses of the data scientist are to be writing reusable codes. And that is where probably the DevOps is also going to work a little bit with the data scientists. And at the end of the day, probably take over that code, try to work on those codes a little bit more so that they can push into production. So it's not going to be completely uh, 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 thrown away, uh, but rather working with the data scientists to take all of those lines of codes in a Jupyter Notebook, right, and trying to translate them into pure uh, uh, codes which can, uh, your Python scripts, which can actually uh, run on, uh, on 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 uh, on your terminal. I mean, you know, on the, the uh, which can actually run uh, by launching the script through your terminal, for an example. So, I think he's open for questions. Also after the talk, thank you very much, Yasir. <laughs>